the new album, the title of which is Nearly Human, um, was recorded under what might be considered nowadays unusual circumstances, although 25 years ago it was more or less the norm. Uh, I decided to record everything live in the studio without overdubs because in listening to much of uh, contemporary music, uh, there was something missing for me. There was a great dependence on machines, uh, sequencers, and synthetically generated music. And I was missing a certain uh, performance element. Uh, the uh, idea that music is a language, a communication medium that uh, people use to convey ideas to each other. So I wanted to uh, create a circumstance where that would be uh, optimized. So I decided to do the album uh, entirely live in the studio. The procedure was that I would have uh, various musicians, anywhere from uh, 8, 10 to up to 30 musicians come into the studio and we would spend a few hours uh, getting sounds and, and learning the song. And then I would go off work with uh, background singers for an hour or so, come back uh, and put the singers and the players together and we would rehearse a little bit more and then we'd start recording and the whole process would take eight, ten, I guess at the most probably about ten hours. It's very difficult to get everyone uh, together in the same place at the same time because everyone's used to doing things the other way. They say, well, can I come in later and overdub my, my part? And, um, and I would have to say, no, that's not the concept here. The concept is that we're all going to look at each other at the same time. We're all going to, uh, to listen to what we're doing and sort of uh, uh, come up with something on the fly. People from uh, Bourgeois Tag, a band that I had produced, and I had seen them play live, and I thought that they were a really good live band and that they were very uh, uh, musically uh, astute so that they would work well under the pressure of uh, trying to learn and perform these songs in, within an eight-hour period. So I got a commitment from them to do a, a principal part of the rhythm section. Um, I also used members of the tubes. Uh, another band that I had worked with. A lot, a lot of the people on the album were people that I had worked with before. Members of Utopia showed up on a sort of surprise session. I didn't know they were going to be there. Um, the reason why I, uh, uh, why I didn't ask them to do it in the first place is because everyone in the band is off doing various individual projects. And it seemed impractical to try and get them together for, uh, for a any substantial part of the record. But uh, someone else uh, uh, contacted them, uh, unbeknownst to me, and managed to get everyone uh, in the same place at the same time for us to do a song together. Having done everything live and wanting to preserve that live interaction, I would have to cut together uh, the best elements of the various performances that we would get during, uh, during the, uh, the day's recording. And uh, since I was using the state of the art in, in uh, digital recording, a digital 32-track machine, uh, this extensive editing on the, on, the, uh, on the complex master level was not something that was uh, commonly undertaken. Um, I used the, uh, what was uh, one of only two uh, machines that were specially designed to be capable of doing this uh, digital editing. And, uh, and it required about four or f five days uh, just simply uh, of l looking, f looking for the best pieces of the performance and then electronically splicing them together. It was fortunate for me, I had always thought that uh, this was what I was going to do, but it was fortunate for me that the uh, technology caught up just in time to allow me to do this electronically. Otherwise, I would have had to do a lot of transfers to a sort of uh, uh, a less pristine technology and do uh, an old-fashioned uh, razor blade cut and, cut and paste editing. I guess it is an irony that, that in trying to come full circle that, we, uh, that it, it brought all the technology almost back down to the same level again, you know, brought it down to, uh, to being as limiting as it was uh, uh, 
uh, liberating. The One of a Nail was one of the first songs that I wrote um, in, in terms of this particular project. And I'd always had it in mind to, uh, to make it sort of a, a duet, not, not a full duet, but there were certain parts of the song in which there was, a, there was an answer, sort of an overlapping uh, vocal part. And I wanted someone who had a, a voice that had some distinctiveness that was recognizable, but, uh, but different from my own. And so I made up a list of singers. And uh, as it turned out, one of the people on the list, Bobby Womack, actually did perform the song. A lot of the lyrics are based on this old uh, proverb or, or paradigm, whatever, uh, whatever you might call it. Uh, the, for the one of a nail, a shoe was lost for the one of a shoe. The idea being that, uh, that uh, details are as important as, as great grand gestures. I guess the other significant uh, personality piece in terms of the songs that we uh, recorded was I Love My Life. We called up uh, Narada Walden and asked him to sort of supervise uh, what, would, what turned out to be a two dozen singers uh, doing a sort of a choral thing. They were split up into two separate units and they did kind of two choruses. And he brought along a lot of people, one of whom was uh, Clarence Clements, kind of as a surprise uh, addition there. Um, and in, I think Clarence appears somewhere in the album graphics there. We got a big, pic, kind of a panoramic photo from that session. And, uh, and there's hard evidence of his participation. The uh, unique thing about Parallel Lines is that it's, uh, it wasn't written specifically for this record. Um, it was it is a song that uh, is part of uh, another project that I'm involved in, which is, uh, which is a Broadway musical. It's not the usual kind of song that I write. I don't usually write songs that are, that are resigned or, or hopeless in that sense. Uh, and I don't know whether it really is uh, that hopeless, but uh, I don't usually write songs that, uh, that don't uh, express uh, some kind of hope of resolution. And uh, the lyric of this particular song is, is essentially about accepting uh, uh, a relationship, let us say, that, uh, that is never going to evolve into something more. Can't Stop Running was the surprise uh, utopia track. The, uh, the session uh, I originally scheduled just this sort of, uh, not the normal contingent, but the contingent of musicians that were available and that, uh, that I expected to show up on the session. And then uh, I walked into the studio and there were these three guys standing there, um, which uh, caused me to go through a certain, you know, on the spot radical readjustment <laughs> of, uh, of the concept because, uh, because I had expected, you know, to have to teach certain other people the song. And then there were the, the guys from Utopia and I knew that they'd certainly be able to play it. It just, uh, I thought, oh no, now I've got too many players. But it was the first time we'd all been in the same room together for probably five years. Um, and it was really, uh, it was really a buzz, you know, to play together.